Good morning, everyone. My name is DJ Betancourt, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Commissioner of the New Hampshire Insurance Department, and I want to welcome you to our monthly webinar series. This month, we're going to be talking about understanding the insurance claims process and the consumer agent company relationship. We are looking forward to a great conversation this morning. For those of you who have joined our webinars in the past, you know, because I've said this over and over, uh, that for consumers, when they have to file a claim, it is usually because something bad has happened to them. And so they're in a stressful position, and it's a difficult time for them to understand a complex insurance document, which uh, includes, of course, how the claims handling process works. So we're going to tackle that this month with our great team, and hopefully this will be a great reference for consumers to uh, to take a look at if they should need to file a claim. Uh, hopefully it'll make them better uh, to understand their uh, better uh, to uh, increase their uh, insurance literacy, if you will. So I'm going to hand it off to my team so we can get this thing started. Uh, oh, before we do that, excuse me. Uh, should you have questions for this webinar, please use the chat function. Uh, and we will swing ourselves around to answer those questions probably towards the end of the program. Great. I'll take over from there, Commissioner. This is uh, Keith Nye, Deputy Commissioner here at the Insurance Department, and kind of uh, segueing uh, with what the Commissioner just mentioned. Um, claim processes can be very challenging for consumers. Uh, fortunately, here at the Department, we do have a consumer services staff, which does specialize as one of their uh, core missions, which is investigating um, insurance complaints. And more often than not, those complaints do relate back to uh, claims where consumers do not feel as though they're being uh, treated fairly. Um, typically, those complaints, uh, those claims complaints rather, uh, fall into two categories, which are property and casualty uh, claim complaints and health claim complaints. Uh, you know, just by by reference, uh, we also deal with complaints involving life insurance and annuities, but as you can probably imagine, the claim process for those products where typically the consumers either deceased or not tend to be pretty clean. Uh, those complaints are typically focused around uh, the sale of the products, but the claims themselves, last year we handled almost 700 complaints on the health side and an additional 650 on the property and casualty side. So. Um, with that note, please know that we have a function here to assist you, but to get into the details of that, I'm going to transition first over to our Director of Property and Casualty Insurance, Mr. James Fox. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's nice to be here. And so I, I guess I'd start uh, in terms of just as a little bit like PNC. So for those who might not know that, that means property. It's pretty straightforward. So property, that's your house and your car, uh, those types of things. And uh, for a company, you know, buildings. And then a, a casualty uh, generally means liability insurance, so that's kind of a catch-all, but that's what everybody knows from an automobile policy to a homeowner's policy to a BOP if you're a business owner. Um, and then like you have then you have single policies like a, like a commercial general liability that's only liability. So that's what I'm, I, I work with. Uh, I thought um, that the best way to start uh, coverage, as the commissioner said, it is before an accident. So the first thing I would suggest in terms of the claim process is before the accident is to one, understand the design of the policies. So that should be pretty straightforward. It's one of the first things I learned big when I became a coverage attorney from an attorney named Andy Dunn. Uh, and that is that uh, every policy has its trigger. So if you have a property policy, that would be a peril like a fire. Uh, and then if you have, if you're talking about the liability side of the policy, then you're usually talking about an accident. So the first thing the insurance company does is it gives you all of that coverage. And you think that is a lot of coverage. Uh, but then after that, you have uh, how they limit that because um, they don't just give, you know, all coverage because it'd be very expensive um, that they basically do conditions. So you need to do certain things to get the coverage. A lot of times, like, for example, you have to cooperate with the company, which does tie into the claims um, and things like for um, liability. If it's an intentional act, that won't be covered. So it'll be exclusions. So you get a conditions and exclusions that take away from the very large coverage grant. So. Um, it is always, I think, a good idea, uh, even if you're a lay person to just, you know, ask for your, a copy of your policy and, and go through it, look, look through it. And if you have questions, then you can call the insurance company and ask some questions. Um, and now the other, one of the other issue is, as I said, the insurance company. So there's three ways to buy policies. The way I look at it in the state of New Hampshire, you can buy them in every state. You can buy them directly from the insurance company. So that would be like, um, like a progressive 
uh, or you can buy them from uh, a captive agent. So that would be like State Farm has captive agents where they just sell State Farm. Or you can buy them from an independent agent. An independent agent sells policies for multiple companies. Um, and so if you have questions, uh, if you're uh, buying direct, you call your uh, insurance company. If you're if you have a captive, you you work with your captive your captive agent. And if you have independent, you work with the independent. I think if you don't know insurance, the best way to work is either with an and probably with an independent agent or with a captive. Um, and the upfront sale, they'll explain the different policies to you. Now, on that note, it is important to understand if you're making a claim that we have been using the word agent. So the agent is the agent of the insurance company. It's not your agent. Uh, in that world, um, some people, um, usually with higher ticket items, will have a broker who will go out and search for insurance. So that's the has the duty to the uh, insured. Let's call it. Whereas an agent has the their duty is to um, the insurance company primarily. So that's where you have to really think about um, when you're having a claim. Um, you know, don't think that the agent just handles everything and and you don't need to do anything. The other little uh, little pre uh, issue I would mention is that if you no matter who you call, you should very be very clear about whether you're putting a claim in or you just have a coverage question. So because uh, you put a claim in, that's going to that would count against you in terms of your um, rates, how much you're going to pay so you because then you're you're increased who you are as a risk. So if you think you don't want to put a claim in, but you're curious, you want to just call and ask coverage questions, even if you've had an accident. So now let's go to the accident. So if you've had an accident, we've all had accidents, and then you, you think to yourself, wow, all the things I need to do, I would say one of the one of the most important things you need to do is think about what insurance policy you purchased that you think uh, would cover that. So if you have an agent, just call your agent and explain what's happened, and they'll they'll explain the process. Each company's different between the agent and the company and what their contract says. But if you have an agent, start with the agent. If you don't have an agent, then you need to go to the uh, company itself and then you know there's usually a phone number you can probably just even um look it up on your on your uh, mobile phone uh, or you can probably you can do it through the internet if you want to so that's the first thing so and then just because you've contacted them again don't think that that's the end in the beginning i would say your your obligation i would say if you want the best result from your insurance company you need to again make sure you cooperate with your insurance company participate uh, if you have questions, be the squeaky wheel. You have to call. You have to be what I would call be a self-advocate. Self-advocates um, in any area of life tend to do the best. So don't be shy. Don't be a self, you know, be a self-advocate. Don't rely on the agent only. Don't rely on the company only. You have to, if you have a question, you 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 push, you know, to get an answer. And I would say uh, if you're unable to get an answer, then that's when I would suggest you call the department. And then that's when you talk to um mr nyan's a uh, former group the consumer group uh and they will help you with uh, they you'd be a, a consumer assistance at a minimum if not a complaint and they would explain um the process to you uh the other little thing i would say um in terms of when you're cooperating and participating you have to also remember that when the company gets the case they're gonna they're gonna or the claim i don't say it's a case they're gonna put an adjuster on so they're gonna get a professional adjuster they're licensed with the department, um, they're professionals, uh, and they methodically, I would say, go through each claim they have, and they'll have they'll have a caseload, just like a lot of other professions at the department, we all have caseloads, and probably you do in your life. So I would also say that the time frame, which we'll get into, we have a little bit later, I'll get into the, the mandatory time frames for the insurance companies, but you have to also remember that things aren't done, um, say you have a major car accident, you know, things aren't gonna be resolved, extremely quickly. It's going to take some time to go through all the facts that the company needs to know to make the decision. So that would be kind of a, your your upfront obligation, I would say, as, as a consumer self-advocate. And then what we do at the department is we have obligations that the legislature, we're enforcing them, the legislature has put on the insurance companies. So the first thing that we have is what's called unfair insurance trade practices. And within that is unfair insurance claim practices. And as I was looking through that, there's, there's four things I would think that apply to claims most directly. Um, one is companies, and sometimes they do it accidentally, which means they don't get in trouble. But if they do it something other than accidentally, then they would tend to get fined for it. So the one is they can't misrepresent facts to you. Um, so if they, you know, any fact misrepresentation um, would would be a problem. And how we 
capture that as we go back through market conduct, we go back and you know, we go to the companies and we look through files and make sure that their claims processes was consistent with our law. And then with not misrepresenting facts is the other the other piece is not misrepresenting policy provisions. So that is something I think we should look, spend a little bit of time. So let's say you have a claim and you call the company and you self advocated and they come back and say this is not covered. Here is the provision in the policy that, that states is not covered. Now, if you read that, it's just English. If you read it and you think, I'm not sure this applies, then there's a there's a something you should remember. This is a rule that's been in New Hampshire for as long as I've been an attorney, which has been a very long time, uh, is that if there's two different ways to read a policy and one provides coverage, then you get the coverage. So if you think that there's a way that does provide a different way to read it, you should advocate to the company that for your your um, how you think it should be read. And then if that doesn't work, then you can come then you can come to the insurance department and how we handle coverage uh, cases is that we don't if, if it could be one way or the other, then it's not our role to step in because that's an unfair insurance trade practice. But if we feel which has happened that your interpretation is really the interpretation, then we will push extremely hard that the company must uh, provide the coverage. So there is um, that um, backstop for you. So we're there for that. And then the next, so that's one, that's number one. Number two is it's supposed to be um, prompt and reasonable investigations. And I would say in this, now I would also like to say again, that most of the companies do a great job and, you know, but it is everybody had those people that work at all companies. So if you happen to hit on someone who's, you know, has um, other, some issues that make it so they're less than optimal in their job, um, you have to make sure you protect yourself. And so one of the things you think, if you think the company hasn't come out and looked at something they should have looked at or hasn't done something they should have done, that's where this comes into play. So if we would say with the department, like a reasonable investigation in this case might include looking at a police report and the company has not, looked, not asked for the police report and has not looked at the police report, then that would be a problem. So if you, if you think the company has not done, again, a, a good uh, investigation, you could call the company and say, look, you need to do more investigation. This doesn't seem appropriate. And if that if they don't do that, then you can come back and to the department again and ask to explain that that didn't happen and we would look into it. The next one, which is the biggest of all the tickets, is that the company did not fairly settle with you. Under the under the unfair insurance claims practice, the companies must always fairly settle. So if you get a like a settlement offer that you just think is way off, we think it's you think it's an eye popper. So it's not like a gray area. Well, I think it's uh, you know, a thousand twenty dollars and they're saying a thousand forty five dollars, then or it could be the other round. Um, then again, you should you should advocate for yourself and contact the department saying that they're not they're not fairly settling with me. And, and a fair settlement is a very broad obligation on the insurance company. So anything you think they're doing that is actually inequitable, unfair, that an, an outside person looking at it would not agree that what they're, that what they're doing is fair, then you need to self-advocate. If that doesn't work, then call the department and we'll look into it for you. Uh, and then the last one, which is very much tied in, which is a more, more recent one, is uh, the legislature. There was a concern that the companies, in some instances, again, not all, were under underestimating and valuing claims. So if we saw, say, on a market conduct basis, that the company was um, like systemically underestimating claims, then that would be a violation of this law. So that's the statutory way we look at things, and then things always kind of follow the same process. So, uh, and I think we'll put these links up at some point so, uh, for the YouTube video that you can actually people can look at the what I'm talking about. The next thing we do is we have rules that underlie that. And that first thing that that obligates the insurance companies to do is the timelines, um, which are, you know, it, they're pretty simple if you know them, but if you don't know them, they're not. Uh, so once the company is notified of a claim, they must start the investigation, which we said must be prompt and reasonable uh, and within five days. They must um, accept, uh, let you know they've accepted the claim. Uh, within 10 days and that's they're starting the investigation and they're supposed to decide the claim if they can so if it's a simple claim they're supposed to decide the claim within 30 days but if they can't decide the claim within 30 days for example they need more information they might need information from the insured or the claimant then a letter goes out of a so-called 30-day delay letter saying we can't we can't do this uh within this time period and within that letter they're supposed to explain to you why they can't do it within the time period so again, this is all designed from a regulatory perspective to make sure that you're in the loop, you understand what's going on. So if you had a claim and you weren't getting these notifications from um, the insurance company, then you would want to contact them and say, I didn't, you know, I don't understand why I haven't received these. I don't understand. I, I'm not, I, I'm a little in the dark here. 
uh, and they should bring you out from the dark. I mean, sometimes people are on vacation, they get transferred so that you can fall through the cracks and so don't wait, call the insurance company. It's better to call more often than not enough. And then once the, another big one is once the, settle, uh, once the claim is settled, now, uh, and every attorney knows this in the state, they must um, pay you um, within five days. So you should get your check once everything they received, all everything they need to finalize the claim. So they've accepted the liability. There's been an agreement about the damages. All the paperwork that they need is in place. It's supposed to get you the check within five days. And also, if if they're not going to pay you, similarly, if they're not going to pay you, they ask to give you a den denial letter explaining why they're not going to pay you. And then if you get one of those and you don't agree with it, again, now you should definitely uh, contact the department to help you understand it. Now, we may go through it and explain to you why uh, it is a reasonable decision, um, but that's what we're here for. So in, in addition to those kind of like time uh, requirements, which there are more, but those are the biggest highlights. There's also some specific things that over the year have become that have been a problem. So they have their own um, specific rules, and some of them are very long, like total loss valuation for uh, a vehicle could be its own um, its own webinar. So I can't go through all this, but undisputed amounts. So undisputed amounts. That one's very easy. The company's supposed to pay undisputed amounts. So if they're disputing, they're disputing part of it, but not disputing all of it. You're supposed to get to the check for the part they're not uh, disputing. I just said total loss auto is a very complicated rule. Uh, people are very tied to their vehicles, so it's a very complicated system of the um, department accepting uh, valuations for uh, how much cars are worth. Uh, and we do get a lot of complaints about that, but um, the system is the best system we can come up with. There's also a total loss for for non-auto, so the same same process. So in either case, if you you received a, a total loss offer from the insurance company and you disagree with it. Uh, then you should contact the department. As I said, there's a section in this about uh, adjusters that adjusters must be licensed. That is a big no-no if the insurance company is not using licensed adjusters because we have to be able to hold those adjusters accountable. Uh, there's a whole section on claimants about rental. Which a lot of people don't know. If, so if you're a claimant, so you're not the insurer, you're the claimant. Say you're a liability person, you, you, you were hit. Um, you're entitled to a vehicle that was like your vehicle that you had. And the insurance company is supposed to tell you that and they're supposed to give you the vehicle immediately. We had one case that involved the person, uh, the, the damaged vehicle was a tow truck, and then the insurance company had to um, bring a tow truck. Um, that we have uh, standards about ready, willing, and able repair. So if the insurance company tells you, oh, well, you can get them, we're going to give you a check for um, $1,000 to repair, uh, then and then you go out and you find nowhere that, that will do it for $1,000. Um, this is particularly non auto. Uh, then um, the insurance company is supposed to uh, pay you the difference. Now, in auto, it generally works that way too, but it's a very specific process that goes through because um, a lot of times it, been, it ends up being uh, independent auto body shops and how that process works uh, and the company offering a, a shop and then somebody else wants to use their own shop. So there's a back and forth process within the, that rule. It's pretty detailed and how that gets figured out who's supposed to pay what. Uh, and there's a whole section about jewelry. Um, which is again how how to value jewelry, and the last thing they have, which is something that's very unique to New Hampshire, because we don't have mandatory insurance. So one of the ways you can protect yourself is if you get hit by an uninsured motorist and they're at fault and they've been identified, then you don't have to pay your deductible on your uh, for your for your property. Um, so that there's a rule in there to again uh, make it so that you're fully able to protect yourself, and we don't need to have mandatory uh, auto insurance. So that is you know pretty much all of the issues that's come up from us for regulatory perspective. Um, that's how uh, they're handled. But again, I would say from a PNC perspective, the, the best thing you can do is is be very interactive with the company, um, balance that with an understanding that, you know, a complicated claims not going to be, you know, settled within an extremely short period of time. If you say, my God, it's been three weeks. Um, well, that's a very short period of time. Say your house is uh, three quarters destroyed. So it's, uh, and they need to go through the whole house and and, and rebuild it. It's obviously not going to be completed in like two or three weeks. So you have to kind of balance that. But if you have any concerns, again, uh, the, I think the best thing you can do after you talk to the company is talk to the insurance department. Uh, our, our our people that are in the consumer division are amazing. They're, they're expert, industry experts for years and years, most of them. And uh, they know how what should and should go forward and when it should go forward. And they are, they're hugely helpful. And with that, I would say that's uh, pretty much how uh, how uh, PNC works. So I'll throw it back to Keith, I guess.
All right. Hey, thanks, James. Uh, appreciate that. You know, it's interesting in hearing you talk about it. There's obviously a lot of uh, interactions between certainly the insurance companies, um, other licensees, whether they be adjusters or or agents um, in that property and casualty claim process, you know, and you can hear from Jason Dexter here in a moment. And, um, you know, while most complaints we receive here at the insurance department involving property and casualty products do relate to claims, you know, about property damage. Um, the overwhelming majority of cases relative to health insurance also about claims, but it's very different. It's much more emotional. You know, property is property, and I think we're all fortunate where we can recognize that a home and an automobile can be replaced. Um, health insurance claims are very, very different. It's usually contemporary. Somebody we either ourselves or somebody we know and love is in the hospital or seeking treatment. And it's it's more emotional, but it still involves the the, the claim process. What I think is a fundamental difference in that aspect um, is while a property and casualty claim is typically between the insured and our licensee on a health insurance claim, it's typically between the provider, the medical doctor, um, who's responsible for that claim, if you will, and the pricing um, in the insurance company. So on that, I'm going to transition over to Jason Dexter, and he can walk us all through the health insurance claim process. And thank you, Keith. Um, and thank you, James. That was a very good overview of uh, contracts and agents, et cetera. That's a lot of heavy lifting for me. Thank you. Um, my name is Jason Dexter. I'm the Director of Life and Health. And I think, you know, James' intro, uh, for the most part, applies in the world of life insurance and or supplemental health insurance, where that relationship, when you have a claim, if you've done all the things that you know, James recommended you do by looking at your policy, um, th those claims are going to go either directly to the, the carrier, insurance carrier, or if you have a broker, you can reach out to your broker. You know, the, the supplemental health insurance products, examples of those are accident only, hospital indemnity, uh, critical illness, disability insurance, a whole line of, of products where uh, that claims process is, is somewhat similar. Um, the, the world shifts a lot, as Keith said, when you get into the world of health insurance, sometimes referred to as major medical insurance where the the world of health insurance claims uh, for the most part is is what's called managed care so what that means is that your medical providers are in a network and they have a big contract that they enter into with the insurance carrier that define the terms of how they interact with one another um, and so you probably if you've gone to a doctor recently uh, the first thing they ask you for when you walk through your door is a copy of your insurance ID card. And they take a copy of it. They want your group number. If it's group policy, they want your ID number because they're getting ready uh, for that claims process uh, you know, when, you, when you leave. Um, and that's going to identify who your carrier is. Uh, there's numbers on the back of that ID card, which are customer service card numbers. There's likely claims numbers back there. Um, so that really starts that process of, of, of shifting the, the general relationship off of the consumer and into the hands of these two contracted entities, the, the providers and the carriers. Um, so kind of like what Keith alluded to is we do have a lot of health insurance complaints that come in consumers issues and they're kind of bucketed and a, a few things that we'll kind of walk through today just to give you an idea of when we tend to see problems one of those is you know, managed care as you said has networks so generally speaking you need to treat within that network and that means when you're setting up your appointments or going to your provider you need to look and make sure they're in your network if you have questions about that um, please call your insurance carrier they've got provider network uh, documents. They've got customer service that can help you, you know, wade through those, uh, so you get somebody that's within network. And your your provider, if you go to your say your primary care physician, uh, they have that contract with their carrier. If they're going to do a referral out to a lab or a um, a specialist of some sort, they need to do that referral out to to in to in network providers. 
we do see that happen. Um, so be aware of that. If a, your provider is sending you to someone who's not in network, uh, that, that could end up being an issue for you. We see a lot of those complaints. So that's the kind of the network issue. We have that bucket. Uh, the next bucket is the prior authorization, which is another managed care tool. Um, if you are getting a referral to certain types of providers or a certain type of care, or you're being admitted to a hospital, um, it's not convenient for you when you're being admitted to a hospital to make a phone call to your carrier to, to manage a prior authorization requirement. Your provider's um, obligated to, to manage that process. That requires them to reach out to the carrier, um, explain the circumstances, and get approval from the carrier for some action or some referral. Um, we often see some claim complaints that come in in that uh, venue, um, either because there's confusion uh, on the provider part, they haven't provided you know, the exact information, um, or there's a lack of communication, or they get prior authorization for say three days, um, but you stay nine days in a hospital and they, they haven't followed up. And that can create some noise. Uh, so be, be aware of that issue. Um, and then the third issue that comes up is, is policy exclusions. You know, whether you're a supplemental health policy or a major medical policy, there are exclusions in there for certain types of, of, of care or you have policy limits. Um, you, for example, yoga comes up a lot. Is your yoga covered under your insurance policy? No, typically not. That's going to be an exclusion. Um, so you get a referral to that or massage is another one that that you're going to oftentimes is excluded or has policy limits. Um, that's something that's likely not covered. But generally speaking, if you that process, if it's working, you're not going to be aware of it. If that provider is sending out that bill directly to the carrier, um, information's coming back and forth from them, money's coming back and forth from them, there are prompt pay laws which require carriers to pay providers promptly, uh, depending on the type of claim that's filed, um, and that back and forth happens. With that said, there are millions and millions and millions of dollars in claims which get filed every month, and there are issues that come up. Uh, if you hear of an issue and you get something uh, in the mail that you don't understand, maybe you get an explanation of benefits that it has partial or part denials, um, pick up the phone. As James said, self-advocacy is super important and can clear up issues um, sooner rather than later. Um, and other times it's just if you're if you're not getting your carrier might say you know, i'm not getting paid or prior authorization is not uh, getting approved timely uh, that's another opportunity for you to call your carrier that number on the back of that id card and nudge them along if the nudging isn't happening quickly enough um, and just call consumer services and we see those types of things come in all the time as well, where we can kind of get that claim moved around and we have contacts that gets that that information flowing uh, sooner rather than later. Um, so that's kind of your general idea there. I think if you end up with a, a major denial where it's just a flat denial of something, there's another process which Keith is going to speak to because he knows it a little more intimately than I do of a grievance and appeals. But with that overview, I'll hand it back to Keith and, and look forward to questions if we got them. Thanks, Jason. So just kind of as kind of a quick recap, uh, you know, really kind of talking about two different types of health insurance claim denials. One of those would be contractual. Um, and as that certainly suggests, something is contractually excluded from coverage. However, the 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 other type are those for medical necessity. It could be a particular treatment that you as a consumer have received has been denied, or it could be that a particular treatment that that your provider has recommended um, is being denied. That's called um, it's 
adverse decision, if you will, is the term that we use here in the insurance department. If a medically necessary treatment is being denied, um, you have what we call in the state of New Hampshire's external appeal rights. Um, understanding the appeal rights, it's also important to understand the life cycle of a health insurance claim. And uh, I think as Jason touched upon it, you really kind of talking about four different parts of the claim cycle. Um, the initial claim is always submitted electronically between provider and carrier. The carrier is making a decision to approve or deny that claim electronically through its computer system. Um, up next, if that claim is approved, certainly there's no issues. Things are, the claims are being paid. Consumers are unaware and everything moves forward. If the claim is denied initially um, at that electronic level, initial claim denial, um, next, is what we refer to as clinical appeal or peer-to-peer. -peer. And in this case, that's where the treating medical physician um, would be notified of denial, would be able to reach out to the insurance company um, and request a peer-to-peer -peer consult, a doctor-to-doctor -doctor consult to say, hey, listen, my patient uh, I've known for, for many years, this particular treatment is desired, here are the medical reasons why. That peer-to-peer -peer consult or um, Clinical appeal usually resolves the situation. If it doesn't, the consumer then has what we call internal appeal rights. And these are all statutory or um, legal rights that consumers have in the state of New Hampshire. On internal appeal, the consumer, again, in that advocacy role of reaching out to the insurance company, calling the number on the back of the insurance card, the instructions also appear on the claim denial letter, would contact the the insurance company and say, I wish to exercise my internal appeal rights, at which point an individual or entity other than the original denying authority has to review that claim with a clean set of eyes and then make a decision as to whether or not that that treatment is going to be denied or approved by the carrier. So it's just de novo review, um, which again can result in either that claim being approved or the claim being denied. If that claim is denied, you then have what is called external appeal rights. This is a very important consumer level uh, uh, appeal right that we administer here at the insurance department. Um, if you were to go to our website, you could click on for consumers, end up on our consumer complaint page. And there's an electronic form that a consumer can complete, which basically says, hey, I've gone through these first few steps of, of appeal and I wanna exercise my external appeal rights at which point we work with the insurance company and an independent third-party review board. And there's seven of them that we use throughout the country. Uh, one of them's in California, another one's in Washington, DC. So they're literally all over the country. And it's an independent board, independent from the insurance company, independent from your provider, independent from us at the insurance department, who will look at the medical necessity of the treatment that's being recommended and essentially issues a decision that's binding arbitration um, on the insurance carrier. Um, so those are the four types of claim denials or, or appeal level rights. And if you have any questions about those, we always encourage you to talk to one of our consumer services reps. That number is 800-852-3416. Um, that kind of brings us through the, the appeal right stage. Um, there's a lot of information here. I'm going to open it up to questions. Before doing so, I'll turn it back over to Commissioner Betancourt. Well, thank you, Keith, and thanks also to James and Jason. I think this was a fantastic presentation. Very pleased by the number of attendees that have joined us this morning. But of course, this webinar will be available on our YouTube page later. Uh, obviously, we have put a lot of information forward this morning, and we appreciate that this is complicated stuff and that there are a lot of nuances depending on the particular insurance product that you are working with. But hopefully this webinar has helped to demystify the claims handling process, or if nothing else, hopefully it's made it at least a bit more understandable to you. Uh, as you know, these webinars are designed for consumers who are not insurance experts. And our goal, as I mentioned earlier, is to uh, use these webinars to increase insurance literacy uh, for consumers. I think, uh, as Keith mentioned, the key takeaways this morning is to take advantage of the resources that are available to you as a consumer. It will help to ensure that the claim is handled in a timely manner, and it will help the consumer be a better advocate 
uh, for themselves. You know, we understand, and it's good to remember sometimes, uh, that there are human beings involved in this process, and that uh, as a result of that, we're all uh, fallible, and we all make mistakes. And we know that the consumer can get confused, and we know that the companies uh, can sometimes make mistakes in how they handle a claim. And so as difficult as that situation might be, it's always useful to try to take the emotion out of things and reach out to the company or your agent and ask them to assist you or ask them to correct a mistake if you believe that a mistake has been made. And as Keith mentioned, finally, uh, as always, the New Hampshire Insurance Department is here to be one of those resources to the consumer. You can call the Consumer Services Unit at 603-271-2261. Uh, or you can email consumer services, all one word, consumer services at ins.nh.gov. So we'll take a quick peek here at the chat box. I don't see anything. No, I'm not seeing any questions, but if you have any, please feel free to type them in the chat box now and we'll address them. Or you can uh, get us offline at our communications department and we'll forward them to uh, James, Jason, and Keith. And I'll type that in here now. We're not seeing any questions. Um, we appreciate you joining us. Oh, what are your most common sources of complaints? William asks. So yeah, I'll, I'll, take, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first stab and then Keith can get into the details. So our consumer services unit receives about 5,000 calls a year. Of that, the vast majority of them, I want to say all but about 500 of those 5,000 complaints are from consumers who just have a question about their policy. Uh, they're a little bit confused about what their coverages are. They're confused about what their exclusions are. Uh, they may have a question around some terminology. For example, what is actual cash, cash value? Uh, that one comes up so often. We actually did an entire webinar just on that. And then, as I said, about 500 of those actually do turn into formal complaints against uh, their company. Uh, Keith, uh, what would you say are the big ones? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Commissioner. I'm actually going to bump up that number. We dealt with uh, just about a thousand co formal investigations uh, last year, um, and, and by the way, we recovered almost uh, in excess of six million dollars for New Hampshire's consumers. By far, the most popular or or common question for information um, relates to health insurance: what's covered, what isn't, how do I purchase insurance. Um, however, the most common type of investigation is an automobile complaint investigation, um, and that really does turn around, turn on rather the fact pattern of, geez, my car's been totaled, I'm not being paid enough money, or my car's been damaged and the company's not offering a sufficient amount of money for me to repair the vehicle properly. Um, it's kind of our bread and butter on the health side. As we mentioned, the appeal process, we deal with a lot of questions on denied claims, what can I do next? How can I advocate for myself? And ultimately, uh, there was probably, I want to say, about 400 health insurance uh, complaints last year. So, Awesome. Thank you, Keith. There's another one here that asks, what is the time frame for claims processing? Example, medical EOBs, is there an expiration date? Yeah. Want me to handle that one, DJ? Yes, please. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, complicated question. I'm going to keep it keep it general. So, you're again, if your provide your provider is the one who's preparing and sending that bill, and when the invoice is sent to the insurance carrier, there's two basic standards, which is if it's a clean claim and it's filed electronically supposed to be processed within 15 days. If it's fi filed paper, it's 30 days. Um, and then if it's not a clean claim, it kicks out of that system and there ends up being a back and forth. So the vast majority of claims go through without issue. The small percentage that don't, it, there can be a tail on those depending on what's going on behind the scenes, but general rule 15 or 30 days. Very good. Uh, Ken asks, I find that um, providers will done patients on denials as opposed to working with 
contacting health insurance companies themselves, forcing patients into the claims process. Do you advocate or intervene in these cases as the providers or insurers have the contracts? So, yes, we, we end up in the middle of those conversations a lot. Um, and it depends on the scenario with the provider. Um, again, typically, if you've got an in-network provider, it's relatively simple. There's a contract between the two. Um, you know, we have if we get involved, you know, we've got buttons we can push on both sides to try to get those resolved relatively simply. Uh, sometimes you have carriers that are outside the network, and those claims can get you know, complex quickly. And we try to help consumers stay out of that. Um, issue, but sometimes it's just not possible. They have to be a member of that conversation and self-advocate. But th those are times where um, you know, you're an agent or broker and you're helping a consumer get them to us um, so that we can better explain to them the sit particular situation that they're in and get them the best path forward for resolving the situation. I would just add to that that um, I think this also speaks to the point that I made a moment ago, which is um, mistakes happen. And, and one of the frequent mistakes that we see come through our consumer division is uh, the provider just got a little bit confused as to how to appropriately bill for uh, the service that they've rendered to the consumer. Uh, they've perhaps uh, mishandled the prior authorization situation. Um, it's complicated for them too. And so we appreciate that those mistakes happen. As Jason mentioned, we do get involved and we're able typically to resolve those issues pretty quickly. Uh, we, we contact the provider, we explain to them uh, what has happened here and why the company is not moving the claim forward the way that they expected to. Um, you know, we uh, advise the consumer to also contact their provider to maybe resubmit something that wasn't uh, submitted uh, correctly initially. Uh, so we do get involved in those situations. And as I said, we understand that this is complicated. Mistakes will happen, uh, but we do get involved. In, and as I said, we're typically able to resolve those things in a pretty timely manner. Yeah, I, I would say very well said, Commissioner. Um, they're very fact specific many times. Um, if you have any questions, whether or not uh, you're in one of those situations where you're wondering if we can help, give us a call. And again, that's 800-852-3416. Um, one of our consumer services officers can kind of listen to your fact pad and kind of walk you through of whether or not you should be reaching out on your own or filing a formal complaint here at the department. Well, it seems as though there are no other questions, so I guess I would say once again, thank you very much for attending this month's webinar. Uh, Andrew, what are we going to have uh, next month as our topic? Uh, next month, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. AJ, do you, do you know what's on tap for next month? I think it is yet to be determined. All right, well, we will uh, we'll make that announcement in fairly short order, and we hope that you'll be able to join us. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us. You can view this and all of our other webinars on our YouTube page.